I'm very delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, Giles Quorn, who is a director of Giles Quorn Architects and is a consultant on historic buildings. Although based in London, Giles has a strong uh, family roots in Exmoor, and he and his wife Margaret have a house right in the heart of the National Park. Over to you, Giles. Hello, um, I'm a native of both Chelsea and Exmoor from when I was born in 1951 up to the present day. I'm an architect that specializes in the restoration of historic buildings, and I've been fortunate enough to work on numerous country houses and national museums, and I was responsible for the Princess Diana Memorial Museum at Orthrop for Charles Spencer. Deborah Swift, in her article on the Tallow Chandler, states that light has always been a symbol for the move out of ignorance into the light of knowledge. As long as we can manufacture and control light, then we are no longer bound by the seasons or forced to work from sunrise to sunset. Light gives us extra time for work and play and the time to create during the hours free from the chores or work. Electricity and light pollution have blurred the division between night and day. We no longer fear dark, nor are we bound by its restrictions. In fact, within my lifetime, I've seen how isolated farms and cottages on the moor have changed significantly due to the benefits of electricity. My mother bought six lane head named, unfortunately, Beelzebub Terrace at Porlock Weir in 1959. She bought it as a holiday cottage. It, it is part of a row of 17th century cottages overlooking the sea. She knocked the two end cottages together into one and restored them. But before she could do that, she had to fight the county council, which had condemned the properties and was within two weeks of actually demolishing them. The properties were condemned because they had stone floors. They had low ceilings. They had no indoor sanitation, electricity, or any form of heating other than open fires on the ground floor only. The cottage and its neighbour were served by a row of outside earth closets, two together for the grown-ups and a separate little building of six, of, of six um, for, for, for the children. A few years later, my aunt bought Tarble opposite Lucat Farm in a similarly derelict condition, again as a holiday cottage. I remember staying there on numerous occasions. There was obviously no electricity, and because we only had one Tilly lamp, such as the ones which had been shown at Dulverton in, in, in the 1914 photograph, um, we had to use torches to go upstairs. In most cottages, the open fire provided heating, light and cooking facilities. Old cottages tend to have only two rooms, one for the family and the other for animals. It is interesting that open plan living today, which combines kitchen, dining and living areas, are almost a throwback to that past. In the 19th century, the second room was used instead of by animals, but as the parlour and became reserved for special occasions. But also it goes without saying that upstairs bedrooms were without fireplaces, were unheated and of course unlit. And if you look at the picture of a a cottage produced by the mass observation, you can see the parlour has no fireplace. I would not like to lead, mislead you into thinking that the rich with their silver candlesticks were much better served in the 18th century than the rest of the world or the rest of the country. They had beeswax candles, but these were very, very expensive. According to the book of Country House Lighting, in country houses, the cost of wax candles ensured that few were burnt when, when the family were on their own. It is said, for instance, that during the winter of 1756 at Audley End, a mansion at least twice the size of Dunster Castle, only about 12 candles were used each night. On special occasions, the nobility would use vast quantities of candles, but this was just to show off their wealth. In one instance, a, at a party, there was a chandelier that, which was lit with numerous candles, but that chandelier hadn't been used for 20 years. 
For the middle and working classes, tallow candles were the norm. They consisted of a wick surrounded by animal fat, normally sheep or beef. They were extremely smelly for obvious reasons. By late 19th century, they were gradually replaced by something called spermaceti, which was made from whale blubber and, paraf and then by paraffin wax. Subsequently, this was replaced in, in, in some villages and, or towns and, uh, with gas, which was 12 times as bright as candles, and then eventually by electricity that we all benefit from today. But even tallow candles were beyond the resources of most of the poor. They depended on the use of rush lights, which consisted of rushes soaked in animal fat. The great gardener Gertrude Jekyll wrote in 1904 in her book on Old West Surrey, an old cottage friend told me all about it. And though she was 90 years of age, yet when next I went to see her, she'd gone out and found some rushes to show me how it was done. You peels away the rind from the peth, leaving only a little strip. And when the rushes is dry, you dip them through the greasing, dip, dip them through the grease, keep them well under. And my mother always laid hers to dry in a bit of a hollow bark. Mutton fat's the best. It dries hardest. Forgive this sort of pseudo Surrey accent of a, accent of a time. Associated with candles because of their expense, were snuffers and trimmers. Snuffers were cone-shaped and were used to prevent hot, hot wax being spread about uh, when put out. Candle trimmers, and we have an example there of, of a very expensive silver candle trimmer, were used to cut down wicks of candles. They had to be used every four hours to prevent the wicks burning unevenly con and consequently much too fast and thereby using up too many candles. Candles, be they beeswax or tallow, all had to be nurtured. The main source of light in the cottage was the open fireplace. When wood was plentiful and available, it was the preferred fuel before the coming of coal. Usually cottages had no right to cut down trees on anyone's land, but often their employers would allow them to collect dead wood that had fallen from trees. You see a very nice idealized picture of, of a man by, by an open fire cooking his supper and um, uh, with an unused candle. The other source of fuel was turf. As Rob Wilson North has shown in his book on the archeology span of Exmoor Hill farming, this was cut throughout the moor, both on the Royal Forest and on the surrounding commons, such as Simmons Bath or on Withypool. But turf, even when dried, burns very poorly and issues little heat. It was very much a poor man's fuel. We have a photograph there of peat being cut as recently as the late 19th, early 20th century, which is quite surprising. The cast iron range, which used coal, radically changed the cottage kitchen. Coal was brought by boat from Wales across the Bristol Channel to Porlock Weir and other small ports along the coast, with the same boats being used to return with lime and oak pit props. The kiln at Porlock Weir, now occupied by Margaret Drabble, was built over lime kilns. They still exist. The adjoining Weybridge Cottage, now enlarged beyond recognition, was once a single small cell office building with a coal Weybridge which survived into the late 1960s. I remember playing on it with my sister. Coal ranges had integrated ovens that were used for making bread, making the old round bread ovens so characteristic of, of, of Exmoor cottages increasingly redundant. Those round bread ovens were difficult to use because they relied upon hot cinders being placed within them to heat up the oven and sub subsequently removed prior to inserting the bread. Bread was baked in ovens that were always getting cooler. By contrast, modern bread is baked with heat inside the oven. The bread oven would probably only be used once a week and sometimes shared with neighbors. For instance, the two lane head cottages, only the end cottage had a bread oven, but the one adjacent did not. Our image of the past is often perceived through the rose tinted glasses of Downton Abbey, 
or Helen Allingham's and Alfred Quinton's chocolate box watercolours of cottages and the picture postcard villages of Exmoor. However, when I studied architecture, I read Housing Versus Architecture by Martin Pawley that had a photograph of a beautiful cottage with the following caption. Remaining country cottages in most parts of Britain have become prized as country homes. One in Oxford, Oxfordshire boasts of Jaguar, which 60 years before a previous tenant and his family committed suicide as a result of hunger. The romantic beauty of Exmoor has not always been admired. Daniel Defoe in 1724 quotes Elizabeth Lands, who called Exmoor a filthy barren ground. But it was those very characteristics that were soon to be reevaluated. The late 18th century and early 19th century saw the rise of the romantic movement in, art, in the arts and epitomized by poets such as Coleridge, Southey, and Wordsworth, painters such as Turner and de Lutherberg, and architects Nash and Pugin. Whereas in the, art, in the past, art attempted to control and civilize the world, and this was characterized by formality, whether it's formal French gardens and parterres, or constrained by the classicism of the Palladian movement in England. The new approach to nature admired it at its wildest and most picturesque, not at its most constrained. John Butler's 1839 watercolor of Honeycutt, the residence of the Acklands, shows a large thatch mansion covered in trellis and climbing plants. Thatch, normally associated with vernacular architecture, is here an image of sophistication rather than poverty. Concurrent with its construction were the improvements that were carried out to the cottages of Selworthy, now the epitome of the picturesque village, but these were done not for local villagers, but for the Acklands old retainers. The Acklands, though, did have a very long tradition of being benevolent and paternalist landlords and ensured that their cottages and tenants were well maintained and looked after, as we know and can see at Luckham, Bossington and Horner. However, what we see today gives a misleading impression of rural life in the 19th century. The Heritage Albums, 175 Years in Devon by Peter Christie, reproduced courtesy of the North Devon Journal, provides a very different view of rural life that contradicts those cosy images and views that were so selectively made by the artists of the day. It wasn't until the late 19th century, artists such as Frank Bramley, Stanhope Forbes and the others of the Newland School, that the real conditions of the poor of the rural poor were considered a suitable subject for art. Hubert Herkimer's picture, Hard Times, is the most unvarnished image of rural poverty. We see an evicted family on the road with nothing but a very few possessions, mostly his work tools. If we turn back to the subject of darkness and light, the North Devon Journal provides us with an interesting picture of contemporary behavior and mores. In some respect, it's like a source book for a Dickens novel, which ranges from the humorous, such as in 1841, William Gabriel, one of the Bastable Beadles, is fined five shillings, a lot of money, for being so drunk that he had to be taken to the police station in a wheelbarrow. But contrast that humour to the appallingly tragic case of George Thomas, aged nine, being transported to Australia for theft of just under £2 in 1837, and Marianne Cutliffe, aged 11, also transported to Australia in 1848 for seven years after being found guilty of stealing in Barnstable. Remember, the trip to Australia would take about four months, and the potential for molestation and abuse of those children on board would have been enormous. In the same year in 1837, a pauper woman in Pilton, Anne Locke, dies of starvation. The inquiry jury blamed the poor law officers for heartlessness. The fear of darkness and its association with crime can be seen in the attempts to bring streetlights to Barnstable to reduce crime and prostitution. In 1856, the journal reckons that there were 
hundred prostitutes in Barnstable alone out of 4,800 females, a shocking proportion. Prostitution and its association with poverty appears to have gone unnoticed in the 19th century. In 1867, 3,000 people rampaged through the streets of Barnstable during a riot over food prices. The local volunteer rifles and the 200 special constables had to be brought in to the Brindler town back to order. Similarly, the romantic images provided us by Poldark had a much darker face. At Mort Point, North Devon, there were five shipwrecks in 1852 alone. It should be remembered that it was illegal to take cargo if anyone on the ship was still alive. Therefore, wreckers would kill anybody left on board who survived the waves and rocks. One of the most notorious and feared wreckers was Elizabeth Benny, who reportedly drowned sailors with, pitchfork, with her pitchfork until her arrest in 1850. According to I.R. David in 1833, the surprise of Chepstow was wrecked at Lynmouth and the looters were driven off by armed customs officers. In the same year, the Elizabeth of Liverpool, an East India Company vessel, and presumably containing a very valuable cargo, is wrecked at North Burrows, and its cargo is protected by customs officers backed by the local yeomanry cavalry. The crew were exceedingly lucky to be rescued by the Appledore lifeboat rather than the local villagers. With a generally illiterate population, lack of opportunities for self-improvement, financially or socially, many, particularly the men, resorted to alcohol. The same journal provides us with many stories of drunkenness and attempts to introduce the temperance movement to fight the scourge of alcohol. In 1854, a lecture at the Strand in Biddeford, given by an American temperance speaker, attracted 3,000 people. But, the, but despite that, the movement was not universally popular, resulting in regular pitch battles between the pros and the antis. One of the saddest cases of alcoholism was the murder of Hannah Burgess by her father in 1858. When his wife died, he put his two teenage daughters into service. They were very young teenagers, but no one would take his youngest child as she was too young to work. He was forced to pay a minder two shillings and sixpence for her weekly board and lodging. He resented this, and at his trial he stated, stated that he felt this money could be better spent on alcohol. And so he murdered her and buried her body in the Wheel Eliza mine shaft. He was eventually caught in the Swansea do docks, convicted and hanged. As explained previously, though the outside of the cottages could be very picturesque, the inside lacked most of the amenities that we now take for granted. What surprises me is how this situation survived for so long. The Mass Observation Unit in 1948 by W.J. Turner provided a detailed account of life at Luckham. Chapter 8 states that there are baths in the two new council houses with cold taps and drains, but no water. Mrs. Howard uses hers for two children who have a weekly tub from water heated in the copper. The next door bath is not used as they only have kettles for water heating. One villager has a bath in her kitchen, but without outlet is not used. Another has a hip bath, which is not used either. None of the cottages has a water heating system. And so far as can be ascertained, it is the usual and perhaps universal practice in the village to have a strip wash in a basin. My stepfather, a local solicitor, Ray Witham, lived at Witchhanger in Luckham and was shocked to find in the mid 60s, at the time of the swinging 60s of the Beatles, that the tenants of the National Trust still only had earth closets at the bottom of the garden. As most of them were now old age pensioners, he obliged the Trust to provide them with indoor sanitation. His reward for his interference was being evicted from his own house. Subsequently, relations improved with the new land agent for the trust, and he organized the transfer of Dunster Castle to the trust. Adrian Tinniswood, in his life in the English country cottage, wistfully concludes, 
It may be sad that parked cars and power lines dominate the landscape, or ironic that exposed stonework and stripped pine interiors are more due to myth and magazines than to architectural correctness, but at least the English cottage is alive and well, and for the cottage to have a future, it must adapt. Otherwise, it will be relegated to a museum of rural life, an object of curiosity, rather than what it should be, a home. Thank you very much.